Hormheb was the last pharaoh of the 18th dynasty of Egypt. He ruled from either 1319 BC to late 1292 BC, or 1306 to late 1292 BC. Although he was not related to the preceding royal family and is believed to have been of common birth, before he became pharaoh, Hormheb was the commander-in-chief of the army under the reigns of Tutankhamun and I. After his accession to the throne, he reformed the state and it was under his reign that official action against the preceding Amarna rulers began. Hormheb demolished monuments of Akhenaten, reusing their remains in his own building projects, and usurped monuments of Tutankhamun and I. Hormheb presumably remained childless since he appointed his vizier Paramesso as his successor, who would assume the throne as Ramesses I. Early career Hormheb is believed to have originated from Heracleopolis Magna or ancient HNEs on the west bank of the Nile near the entrance to the Fayum since. His coronation text formally credits the god Horus of HNEs for establishing him on the throne. His parentage is unknown but he is believed to have been a commoner. According to the French Egyptologist Nicolas Grimmel, Hormheb does not appear to be the same person as Partanumheb who was the commander-in-chief of Akhenaten's army. Grimmel notes that Hormheb's political career first began under Tutankhamun where he is depicted at this king's side in his own tomb chapel at Memphis, in the earliest known stage of his life. Hormheb served as the royal spokesman for Egypt's foreign affairs and personally led a diplomatic mission to visit the Nubian governors. This resulted in a reciprocal visit by the Prince of Miam to Tutankhamun's court, an event that is depicted in the tomb of the Viceroy High. Hormheb quickly rose to prominence under Tutankhamun, becoming commander-in-chief of the army and advisor to the pharaoh. Hormheb's specific titles are spelled out in his Saqqara tomb, which was built while he was still only an official, hereditary prince, fanbearer on the right side of the king, and chief commander of the army, the attendant of the king in his footsteps in the foreign countries of the south and the north, the king's messenger in front of his army to the foreign countries to the south and the north, and the sole companion. He who is by the feet of his lord on the battlefield on that day of killing Asiatics, when Tutankhamun died while still her teenager. Hormheb had already been officially designated as the RPAT or IRY Patan IDNW by the child pharaoh. These titles are found inscribed in Hormheb's then private Memphite tomb at Saqqara which dates to the reign of Tutankhamun since the child kings. Car touches, although later usurped by Hormheb as king, have been found on a block which adjoins the famous Gold of Honor scene, a large portion of which is in Leiden. The royal couple depicted in this scene and in the adjacent scene 76, which shows Hormheb acting as an intermediary between the king and a group of subject foreign rulers, are therefore to be identified as Tutankhamun and Ankhesenamun. This makes it very unlikely from the start that any titles of honours claimed by Hormheb in the inscriptions in the tomb are fictitious. The title IRY Pat was used very frequently in Hormheb's Saqqara tomb but not combined with any other words. When used alone, the Egyptologist Alan Gardner has shown that the IRY Pat title contains features of ancient descent and lawful inheritance which is identical to the designation for a crown prince. This means that Hormheb was the openly recognized heir to Tutankhamun's throne and not I, Tutankhamun's ultimate successor. As the Dutch Egyptologist Jacobus van Dijk observes, there is no indication that Hormheb always intended to succeed Tutankhamun. Obviously not even he could possibly have predicted that the king would die without issue. It must always have been understood that his appointment as crown prince would end as soon as the king produced an heir, and that he would succeed Tutankhamun only in the eventuality of an early and or childless death of the sovereign. There can be no doubt that nobody outranked the hereditary prince of Upper and Lower Egypt and deputy of a king in the entire land except the king himself, and that Hormheb was entitled to the throne once the king had unexpectedly died without issue.
This means that it is a wise, not Horm Hebb's accession which calls for an explanation. Why was I able to ascend the throne upon the death of Tutankhamun? Despite the fact that Horm Hebb had at that time already been the official heir to the throne for almost ten years, the aged vizier I sidelined. Horm Hebb's claim to the throne and instead succeeded Tutankhamun. Probably because Horm Hebb was in Asia with the army at the time of Tutankhamun's death. No objects belonging to Horm Heb were found in Tutankhamun's tomb, whereas items donated by other high-ranking officials such as Myronact Mine were found in tomb KV-62 by Egyptologists. Further, Tutankhamun's queen, Ankhesen Amun, refused to marry Horm Heb, a commoner, and so make him king of Egypt. Having pushed Horm Heb's claims aside, I proceeded to nominate the aforementioned Nacht Mine, who was possibly a wise son or adopted son, to succeed him rather than Horm Heb. After a wise reign, which lasted for a little over four years, Horm Heb managed to seize power, presumably thanks to his position as commander of the army and to assume what he must have perceived to be his just reward for having ably served Egypt under Tutankhamun and I. Hormheb quickly removed Nachman's rival claim to the throne and arranged to have a wise WV-23 tomb desecrated by smashing the latter's sarcophagus, systematically chiseling out a wise name and figure out of the tomb walls and probably destroying a wise mummy. However, he spared Tutankhamun's tomb from vandalism presumably because it was Tutankhamun who had promoted his rise to power and chosen him to be his heir. Hormheb also usurped and enlarged a wise mortuary temple at Medinet Habu for his own use and erased a wise titillary on the back of a 17-foot colossal statue by carving his own titillary in its place. Internal Reform Upon his accession, Hormheb initiated a comprehensive series of internal transformations to the power structures of Akhenaten's reign. Due to the preceding transfer of state power from Amun's priests to Akhenaten's government officials, Holmheb appointed judges and regional tribunes, reintroduced local religious authorities, and divided legal power between Upper Egypt and Lower Egypt, between the viziers of Thebes and Memphis, respectively. These deeds are recorded in a stella which the king erected at the foot of his tenth pylon at Karnak occasionally called the Great Edict of Hormheb. It is a copy of the actual text of the king's decree to re-establish order to the two lands and curb abuses of state authority. The stella's creation and prominent location emphasizes the great importance which Hormheb placed upon domestic reform. Hormheb also reformed the army and reorganized the Deir el Medina workforce in his seventh year while Hormheb's official Maya renewed the tomb of Thutmose IV, which had been disturbed by tomb robbers in his eighth year. While the king restored the priesthood of Ammon, he prevented the Ammon priests from forming a stranglehold on power. By deliberately reappointing priests who mostly came from the Egyptian army since he could rely on their personal loyalty, Hormheb was a prolific builder who erected numerous temples and buildings throughout Egypt during his reign. He constructed the 2nd, 9th and 10th pylons of the Great Hypostyle Hall in the temple at Karnak. Using recycled talatat blocks from Akhenaten's own monuments here as building material for the first two pylons. Because of his unexpected rise to the throne, Hormheb had two tombs constructed for himself. The first, when he was a mere nobleman, at Saqqara near Memphis, and the other in the Valley of the Kings, in Thebes, in tomb KV-57 as king. His chief wife was Queen Muknajmut, who may have been Nefertiti's younger sister. They did not have any children. He is not known to have any children by his first wife, Amenia, who died before Hormheb assumed power, reign length, 26 27 years or 14 years. This pharaoh's reign length is a matter of debate among scholars. Hormheb's highest clearly known dates are a pair of year 13 and year 14 wine labels from this king's wine estates which were found in his royal tomb, in the Valley of the Kings. 
It is traditionally believed that Hormheb's highest year date is likely attested in an anonymous hieratic graffito written on the shoulder of a now fragmented statue from his mortuary temple in Karnak which mentions the appearance of the king himself, or a royal cult statue representing the king for a religious feast. The ink graffito reads year 27, first month of Shemu day 9, the day on which Hormheb, who loves Ammon and hates his enemies, entered the temple for this event. Donald Redford, in a BASOR 211 number, 37 footnote, observes that the use of Hormheb's name and the addition of a long, Meryamun, epithet in the graffito suggests a living, eulogized king rather than a long deceased one. The Egyptologist Rolf Krauss, in a De 30 paper, argued that this date may well reflect Hormheb's accession where a feast or public holiday was traditionally proclaimed to honor the accession date of a deceased or a current king. Krauss supports his hypothesis with evidence from Ostrich IFAO 1254 which was initially published by Jack Janssen in a BIIFAO 84 paper under the title, A Curious Error. The Ostrich records the number of days on which an unknown dear El Medina workman was absent from work and covers the period from year 26 3 Perret day 11 to year 27 2 Akit day 12 before breaking off. The significant fact here is that a year change occurred in the Ostrakar from year 26 to year 27 around the interval IV Peret day 28 and Ishamu day 13. The year 27 date of Hormheb is located within this interval and would reflect Hormheb's accession date, Krauss suggests. A wise accession date occurred somewhere in the month of 3 Peret. Since Manithor gives I a reign of four years and one month, this ruler would have died sometime around the month of Ivy Peret or the first half of Ishemu at the very latest. This is precisely the time period noted in Ostrica IFAO 1254. The fact that the Ostrica records the case of only one worker rather than an entire group of workmen means the necropolis scribe cannot be presumed, at first glance, to have committed a dating error in altering the unknown king's year date in the interval between IV Peret 28 and Ishemu 13. However, it is manifestly obvious from a close study of Manithor that he did not reckon the last month of a king's reign in the context of a year from the pharaoh's accession date. That was only done in civil dating on a document or monument. Manithor supplied whole regnal years and then gave the month in which the king died reckoning from the beginning of that year. For example, the historian thought Tatshepsut must have died in the ninth month of the year because he knew that Thutmose III succeeded on day four of the first month of summer, thereby assigning her a reign of 21 years and nine months. Janssen, in his original BIFAO paper, noted the curious fact that no known new kingdom pharaohs who reigned for a quarter of a century including Rameses II and Rameses III had their accession date in this time frame and suggests the year change was an error committed on behalf of the scribe. He then attributed the Ostraca to Rameses III, whose accession date was Ishemu Day 26 and expressed his view that the scribe may have inadvertently implemented the year change two weeks early. Instead, Janssen also observed that the paleography of the Ostraca suggests a date in the 20th dynasty partly because it followed the later New Kingdom form of writing and due to its provenance in the Grand Putat region which features numerous dynasty 20 astrakas. However, this form of writing is also attested in monuments of Rameses II and it would, therefore, not be unexpected to find it in a document from the very late 18th dynasty since the transition from the early New Kingdom to the late New Kingdom form of writing had already occurred prior to the end of Hormheb's reign, as Frank Yerko once noted. Indeed, Janssen's paleographical reference for his paper professor, Georges Posner himself suggested a date in the 19th dynasty due to the form of the WSF and Akit text, as Janssen himself writes.
A few 19th dynasty Ostracars have been found in the Grand Putat area prior to the 20th dynasty's intensive exploitation of this region. This does not exclude some late 18th dynasty work here either. Secondly, both Janssen and Krauss stress in their papers that the relative scarcity of the hieratic text in Ostracar IFAO 1254 precludes a clear dating of the document to Ramesses III's reign and that paleography, in general, does not give a precise date for a document's creation. Hence, a dating of the Ostrakar to Hormheb's reign on the basis of the year change is eminently plausible. On other matters, a damaged wall fragment painting from the Petri collection reportedly mentions Hormheb's 15th or 25th year. Another important text, the inscription of Emes, records that a court case decision was rendered in favor by a rival branch of Emes family in year 59 of Hormheb. Since the Emmys inscription was composed during the reign of Ramesses II when the Armanari era pharaohs were struck from the official king lists, the year 59 Hormheb date certainly includes the nearly 17-year-long reign of Akhenaten, the two-year independent reign of Nefaneferu Aten, the nine-year reign of Tutankhamun and the four-year reign of I. Once all these rulers' reigns are deducted from the year 59 date, Hormheb would still have easily enjoyed a reign of 26-27 years. At a well-known 1987 conference in Gothenburg, Sweden, Kenneth Kitchen astutely noted that any attempt to explain away the year 59 Hormheb date as of scribal era fails to consider the long and voluminous listed series of court trials and legal setbacks which Emmy's family endured in order to win back control over certain valuable lands which had been stolen from his family's line. Indeed, Emmys likely ordered the protracted legal dispute, which is presented as a series of court depositions and testimonies of various plaintiffs and witnesses, to be inscribed on his tomb walls in order to create a permanent record of his family's ultimately victorious struggle to win back these lands. Emmys, hence, could hardly be expected to forget the beginning of his family's legal tribulations in year 59 of Hormheb. Kitchen also observes in his paper that Hormheb's extensive building projects at Karnak support the theory of a long reign for this pharaoh and stresses that a good number of the undated late 18th dynasty private monuments that are in both Egypt and the world's museums must in fact belong to his reign. Hormheb, hence, probably was assumed to have died after a minimum reign of 27 or, at most, 28 years. Manetho's epitome assigns a reign length of four years and one month to Hormheb and this was usually assigned to I. However, it is now believed that this figure should be raised by a decade to one, four years and one month and attributed to Hormheb instead, as Manetho intended. Hormheb's new reign length The most recent archaeological evidence from three excavation seasons conducted under G.T. Martin in 2006 and 2007 establishes that Hormheb most likely died after a maximum reign of 14 years. Based on a massive hoard of 168 inscribed wine sherds and dockets recently discovered below densely compacted debris in a great shaft in this king's royal KV-57 tomb, of the 46 wine sherds with year dates, 14 have nothing but the year date formula, 5 dockets have year 10 plus X, 3 dockets have year 11 plus X. Two dockets preserve year 12 plus X and one docket has a year 13 plus X inscription. Meanwhile, 22 dockets mention year 13 and 8 have year 14 of Hormheb but none mention a higher date for Hormheb. The full texts of the docket readings are identical and readers. Year 13. Wine of the estate of Hormheb Meron Ammon, LPH, in the domain of Ammon, Western River. Chief Vintner Tai. Meanwhile, the year 14 dockets, in contrast, are all individual and mention specific wines such as very good quality wine or, in one case, sweet wine, and the location of the vineyard is identified. A general example is this text on a year 14 wine docket.
Year 14, good quality wine of the estate of Horm Heb Meron Ammon, LPH, in the domain of Ammon, from the vineyard of ATFIH. Chief Vintner Hatti, other year, 14 dockets mention Memphis, the Western River while their vintners are named as Nakhaman, Mare, Seager Men, Ramos and others. The quality and consistency of the KV-57 docket strongly suggest that Hormheb was buried in his year 14, or at least before the wine harvest of his year 15 at the very latest. This evidence is consistent with the Hormheb dockets from Deir el Medina, which mention years 2, 3, 4, 6, 13 and 14, but again no higher dates. While a docker described to Hormheb from Sedment has year 12, the lack of dated inscriptions for Hormheb after his year 14 also explains the unfinished state of Hormheb's royal KV-57 tomb, a fact not taken into account by any of those scholars defending a long reign of 26 or 27 years. The tomb is comparable to that of Seti I in size and decoration technique, and Seti I's tomb is far more extensively decorated than that of Hormheb, and yet Seti managed to virtually complete his tomb within a decade, whereas Hormheb did not even succeed in fully decorating the three rooms he planned to have done, leaving even the burial hall unfinished. Even if we assume that Hormheb did not begin the work on his royal tomb until his year 7 or 8, it remained a mystery how the work could not have been completed had he lived on for another 20 or more years. Therefore, Hormheb's reign has been determined and accepted today by most scholars to be 14 years and one month. Manithor had assigned him a reign of four years in his epitome and one month, based on the clear evidence of the wine jar labels and the lack of dates beyond his year 14 but this figure should be raised by a decade. As for the year 27 hieratic graffito at Hormheb's funerary temple at Medinet Habu and the year 59 date from the inscription of Emes. Van Dijk argues that the first date likely inaugurated a statue of Hormheb during year 27 of Ramesses II or three in Hormheb's temple while the latter date of Emes can hardly be taken seriously and indeed is not taken at face value by even the staunchest supporters of a long reign for Hormheb since there was no standard option practice of including the years of all the rulers between Amenhotep III and Hormheb as Wolfgang Hulk makes clear.